the slave part three and insert god please god please don't take him i beg you please don't take him the woman whispered fiercely as she sat on the floor with her legs crossed one knee drawn slightly higher than the other she used her feet to gently and rhythmically rock backward and forward, forward and backward. In her arms, she held her baby, her first child. Unlike his mother, the baby slept, though fitfully. He sensed the anxiety coursing through her and it disrupted him. She knew this was true, but she could not bring herself to put him down. The very thought caused her to draw him closer to her chest, his head resting in the nook of her elbow, her elbow resting on her knee. He squirmed briefly, but then settled into his spot. Do not, do not take him, please. She continued to whisper, not caring how desperate she sounded, how bold, her request was. She looked down in the direction of her little boy. Though she could not see him in the blackness, visualizing his face was simple as she traced the roundness of his cheeks with her fingertips, caressed his toes, and felt them grip her in return, pressed her cheek to his head and felt his warmth and new life scent soak into her own skin. There was more than the feeling of love that connected her to this boy, though that permeated everything. There was duty, the overwhelming need to protect, the knowledge that who he was and who he would become was somehow wrapped up in her own identity, the painful understanding that he had been born into a life of slavery, yet yearning for him to know that that was not what defined him. She wanted to convince him of this as he grew up, longing for her love to be a foundation of confidence and strength in his life. He was her beloved son. And tonight, his life was in danger. Though that fact was under dispute, they had been preparing for this night ever since Moses explained the coming plague to them, that the Lord was going to strike down every firstborn throughout Egypt. That had been almost a month ago now. When she first heard what was at stake, her gut had taken over. She felt courage and love and utter helplessness all wrapped up into one big emotion. God would once again protect them, but they had a role to play this time, and so everyone started following Moses' instructions carefully, very carefully. The instructions took weeks to carry out, as they involved selecting and caring for a lamb, one year of age and without defect, eating bread without yeast for seven days, taking all the lambs that had been gathered and slaying them earlier that night, cooking them, in a very specific way, whole over a fire with bitter herbs and more unleavened bread. They were even given instructions for how to eat it, quickly, with shoes on and cloaks tucked in as if ready to leave at a moment's notice. But if that wasn't odd enough, the whole community was then instructed to collect the lamb's blood in basins and gather hyssop. With the hyssop, they smeared blood on the tops of every single door frame. Somehow, this was what would protect them tonight. The principle was simple, really. If a door had blood on it, your child would be spared. Not. Yes, the principle was simple, but the instructions bothered her. They took time and were very specific. What if she did them wrong? And why did she have to do them at all? She had seen the Lord's power unleashed on Egypt firsthand. 
She had felt the real possibility of freedom along with everyone else in Israel. But this, this was different. Everything else had been so separated. God had done it all. But now, all of a sudden, they were involved in their own protection. Why this plague? Why did it even have to come close to them? But as much as it unnerved her, the instructions did give her something to do. Because she did not doubt that God could make this plague come to pass and did not doubt that he would. If she had learned anything through these plagues, it was that everything God said happened. So as much as she wanted him to just keep this plague away, she was grateful in some ways that there was something she could do about it. She could follow the steps. She could make sure every square inch of their doorpost was covered in blood twice over. As she thought through all this, doubt crept in and a fresh wave of anxiety coursed through her. Her stomach hurt from it. Her skin was cold from the moist fear that kept trying to escape through her pores. Her breath caught in her throat as she tried not to sob. If possible, she hugged her baby even tighter. God, please have mercy on us. Spare us. Spare him. Please, 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 please. She was finding it hard to entrust the life of her child to some blood on the door. Her arm was fairly numb at this point. His little head didn't seem so little after hours of being cradled in one arm. She slowly, slowly adjusted him so that his head rested on her shoulder. This was her favorite way to hold him. He burrowed in her neck and she could hug him fully with both arms. She needed to stand up, she decided. Perhaps pacing would naturally work out some of this anxiety. Glancing at her husband, asleep in their corner, reminded her she was not alone. It did not bother her that he was sleeping. In fact, she was thankful he was not panicked. His confidence that they had done everything correctly, that the Lord would stay true to his word so he could literally rest in that trust kept her from giving herself over to terror. But she did not have the capacity to manage her fear beyond that. As she paced and bounced and prayed, her every sense was on high alert. Everything was so quiet. Not even the dogs were barking. No child was crying. With so much at stake, how could it be silent? Were there no other mothers pacing their homes along with her? With so much silence surrounding her, it felt like she could hear further than usual. Was she just imagining things? What was that screaming she heard off in the distance? She dared not look out the window, as one of the instructions was to remain in their house for the whole night. To even poke her head out seemed too risky. But the sound continued and grew stronger. Her very soul began to tremble. Is it coming? Is this it? She backed away from the window, getting as far away from the door as possible, as far away as she could from the distant wailing, barely perceptible, but for the silence that surrounded the land of Goshen. Please, please, please. She did not know what else to say. And so she desperately pleaded in the dark quiet of her home, clutching her baby with a grip that would challenge death itself, willing her heart, her mind, her soul to trust that the screaming would not come near her. And then she saw it. Light pierced the darkness. It moved. It was as if the light had life in it. It could think, it could respond. And it stopped right outside her door. She could feel
feel it observing the doorpost, considering. Through a slat in the wood, it seemed to be able to see her, to see her child. She was utterly frozen. This was it. This was the moment that had caused her the greatest fear, the greatest anxiety. Literally, in the presence of the thing that had the power to take away the life in her arms. And yet, so great was the significance of this moment. So much mental exertion had been given that as she faced it, her fear somehow paled in comparison. She inhaled, exhaled, noticed her muscles relaxing. How could this be? How is it possible that in this moment, she was actually able to release her grip of fear? With fresh air in her lungs and a clearer mind, logic began to seep into the spaces that had been shut so tightly, replacing the chaos of panic. Her memory flashed to earlier images of the evening, of painting the blood of the slain lamb on the door, but she could not see it. From inside the house, she knew with certainty it was there. And this unexpected certainty gave her strength. She realized there really was no need to doubt. God had been proving himself to her for months proving that he was trustworthy and powerful, proving that he would protect his people. And her little boy was one of God's chosen people. Her mind accepted this truth with relief and embraced all its implications. It was like water for a parched soul a solid foundation for her thoughts to rest. God was for them, and he would not abandon them to the grave. God had provided a way, and she had responded. She had obeyed. With truth as a weapon and a powerful God protecting her family, the woman finally trusted really trusted that the blood was enough to save a life because God had said so. Her son opened his eyes, wakened by the brightness penetrating their house, or perhaps because his mother's racing heart had slowed and her breathing had calmed. The woman broke her gaze with the light and looked into his bright brown eyes. As she did so, the light began to move once again away. Relief escaped from her lungs and the woman joined her husband, coaxing her son back to sleep. As she closed her own eyes, the light passed over her house and the next and the next and the next leaving the land of Goshen 